and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for October 2025. October is a brilliant time to get outside and have a go at some astronomy. The nights are getting darker and there are some exciting things to look out for this month, such as the Orion its meteor shower. We'll also be taking a look at the constellation of Orion itself and the Fra Mora region on the moon. Let's begin by having a look at the planets and seeing which ones are well placed for observing this month. You can see that I'm looking south on the 1st of October in the early evening around 8 o'clock. So the sun will have already set by that point if you are in the middle of the UK. And we can see that Saturn has already risen. Um, so as soon as the sun has set at the beginning of October, you can have a look for Saturn. If you have a small telescope, you we should be able to see that it shows a disc and that the rings, you should be able to see the rings and that they are appearing almost edge on at the moment. And you should also, with a small telescope, be able to see Saturn's bright moon, Titan, as well. Uh, and perhaps some of the other moons, depending on the conditions and the size of your telescope. If we carry on into the evening, we can see that Saturn's getting higher. Uh, so a bit better place to observe as the evening goes on. And we have um, the constellation of Taurus the Bull has risen um, by about 11 o'clock. And if we keep going to midnight, you can see that Gemini rises along with the planet Jupiter. So you have to stay up a little bit late to see Jupiter. But once Jupiter does rise, it gets nice and high. It's very bright. It's very well placed for observation in October. Uh, and this is just a really interesting part of the sky anyway. You've got Taurus the Bull, the Pleiades open st uh, star cluster. You've got Orion the Hunter, which we'll talk about later. Gemini, the twin stars of Castor and Pollux, and then Jupiter very nearby. And if you um, have a small telescope, you can check out Jupiter's uh, disk, the north and south equatorial cloud belts, the four bright Galilean moons as well. If you have a steady hand and a pair of binoculars, you'll probably be able to spot those moons even with binoculars, uh, particularly if you have something to rest them on, like a tripod or even a fence, something like that. Um, so that's the bright planets that are well placed for observing in um, October, not forgetting about Venus, actually, which um, rises in the... Um, in the early morning, a couple of hours before sunrise at the beginning of October um, and Venus is getting less well placed for observing as the month goes on. So if you want to see Venus earlier in the month is better. Um, it rises um, a bit closer to sunrise as the sun, as the, um, the month goes on. So if I just go forward an hour to six o'clock, you can see the sky is starting to brighten over here, ready for the sunrise. But you should be able to get a good view of Venus um, before the sun rises, showing a gibbous phase at the moment. So Venus, Jupiter and Saturn are fairly well placed for observing this month. Mercury is an evening planet, but is quite poorly placed. Um, and Mars is also an evening planet, which is fairly poorly positioned at the moment. Uranus is well positioned. If we move on to the fainter planets, then um, Uranus is a, a good one to have a go at this month, especially if you haven't seen it before, because it is very close to the Pleiades open cluster. Um, and this these patterns should be quite easy for you to spot. So look for the familiar shape of Orion, follow Orion's belt up to um, Aldebaran, the angry eye of the bull in Taurus, for this triangular pattern of the bull's head, and then over to the Pleiades, which should be easily visible with the naked eye, um, as long as you're not in a really light polluted area. Um, and then Uranus is very close to the Pleiades and will be all month. Um, so you can have a find of your of the Pleiades with your binoculars and then um, sweep around this area below and see if you can locate Uranus um, with its bluish uh, hue that it has and um, with a telescope you might be able to um, see Uranus's disc as well. Moving on to the moon now. 
The full moon for October occurs on the 7th and that is also known as the harvest moon because it is the closest full moon to the autumn equinox. If we go to the 7th, we can see the moon over here in Pisces um, fall on the 7th and then if we go um, onwards we can see that on the 10th it goes very close to the Pleiades and in fact um, does occult the Pleiades on the morning of the 10th um, so you can look out for that and if we continue um, to the 13th you can see that the moon gets quite close to the planet Jupiter um, in Gemini on the 13th and the 14th. For our moon watch target this month I thought that we could take a look at the Frau Moro highlands on the moon and the reason that I've chosen that um, region is because in August Apollo astronaut Jim Lovell died at the age of 97 um, and he was the commander of the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission that was due to land in the Frau Moro highlands on the moon um, so I thought it'd be a nice area for us to explore um, in honour of Jim Lovell um, the Apollo 13 mission, um, famously the service module of the spacecraft was damaged in an explosion and they had to abort their landing plans uh, which put the astronauts in um, a huge amount of danger and um, Lovell himself described the mission as the successful failure because the astronauts survived against all the odds um, which I'm sure was not in small part due to his ability to perform under that kind of pressure. Um, and he flew in, in, in space uh, three times previous to Apollo 13 on Apollo 8, which um, was the first crewed mission to orbit the moon, um, returning the famous Earthrise photograph on Christmas Eve 1968. Uh, but Frau Moro was um, considered to be so geologically interesting that NASA decided to land Apollo 14 there instead since Apollo 13 didn't manage to land there um, and that landed successfully in February 1971. So I'm going to change over to my moon mapping um, software so that we can take a closer look at that region. So here we are in Lunar Quick Map with a view of the full moon with the Apollo landing sites marked. Um, you can see over here we have the craters uh, Kepler and Copernicus, so they're very easy um, to spot, so have a look for those first. Also up here we've got the Mare Imbrium, the Sea of Showers, um, with the Bay of Rainbows, like a little extra chunk over on the edge. Uh, so um, Sea of Showers, Kepler and Copernicus craters, down here is the Far Moro Highlands where Apollo 13 was due to land and Apollo 14 did land. Um, and if we go in and take a closer look, so if you have a small telescope and you want to explore this region, um, you won't be able to see um, anything of the landing sites. You need um, really to be in orbit around the moon to be able to resolve a feature small enough. But you can explore the area around the landing site. And um, the things that I would look out for if I was to do that would be um, the Herschel crater over here, um, almost joined on, but not quite, to this big uh, crater down here, which is called Ptolemaeus. So you've got Herschel and Ptolemaeus um, right next to each other. Travelling over here towards the landing site, you've got Leland. Um, which is quite um, a bright but smaller crater than um, Herschel and Ptolemaeus. Um, and then if you keep going over here, you've got this crater here that is called the Crater Parry. And then you've got the landing site over here. Um, this, um, these images that we're looking at now were taken from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So we do have the luxury of being able to zoom in much closer than we would with our ground-based telescopes. And you can see that marked on here is the um, path that the astronauts of Apollo 14 um, took when they were exploring the moon. Um, so the moonwalkers on that mission were Alan Shepard and Ed Mitchell, and then Stu Rusa, who remained in orbit around the moon while the um, two astronauts were on the surface. Um, 
The region is so interesting because it's thought to have been formed by the ejector material that was thrown out from the impact that created the Sea of Showers, which I just pointed it out to you um, when we had a full view on. So if we just go back, uh, zoom out. So we've got the Sea of Showers up here and this, this huge impact that happened at some point in the moon's history that excavated this area that we now know as the Sea of Showers throughout ejector material which um, landed over here, creating this area. Um, so they were able to collect um, samples of rock and dust from that area and bring it back to the Earth uh, for analysis so that we could learn more about that process. Coming back to Stellarium now, because it's a little bit easier to show the phases. So we have our full moon on the 7th, our harvest moon. Um, and you can see um, those regions that I was talking about earlier. So you've got your, your sea of showers over here, Kepa and Copernicus craters, and then the um, Apollo 14 landing site down here. And the best time to view, as is often the case with lunar features, is not when the moon is full, um, but when those features fall close to the terminator line and you get those wonderful um, shadows cast that... Um, make those features easier to um, to see uh, and the best time uh, for the Fra Moro region is six to eight days um, after full so if we go on two three four five so there's six days and you can see that the the region is getting close to the the terminator line and there's seven and then eight when it starts to look like it's getting covered. Um, and you can also do the same thing eight to ten days after new moon as well. Um, what is quite nice to do if the weather is good is to choose your region of interest on the moon. And then you can go out and look at it, maybe sketch it um, over a period of a few days or a couple of weeks and see how it appears to change as the shadows are changing um, as the moon changes phase. On to our constellation of the month for October, which is Orion. I like to do Orion as the constellation of the month for October because we also have the Orionid meteor shower. And it's nice to talk about the two of those things together. As we're in the middle of the month at the moment, if I go back into the evening sky um, before Orion has risen and we can just see what sort of time it rises. So we're about eight o'clock on the 14th. And you can see we've got Taurus rising first, which is always a neighbour to Orion facing off against Orion the Hunter. And then Orion rising um, around midnight at the middle of the month. Um, and it arises earlier as we start to get into the winter. Um, and you can see that Orion is depicted here as a hunter. And I'm just going to put the the art on. So we've got Orion the hunter facing off against Taurus the bull. Um, it contains two of the brightest stars in the sky. Um, so we've got Rigel down here at the foot and Betelgeuse and um, the red giant, uh, super red giant star uh, that has evolved very quickly due to its huge mass and is expected to go supernova sometime in the next million years or so, which in astronomical terms is very soon. Um, when it does, it will be brighter than the moon um, in the sky, uh, so bright that you might even be able to see it in the daytime. So it will be a spectacular event when that happens. Um, when you are observing the constellation of Orion, you see if you can observe the colour difference between uh, Betelgeuse, which is really red, and Rigel, which is more of a white colour. Um, the other things to look out for in Orion are the Orion Nebula and maybe the Horsehead Nebula, depending on your equipment. Um, so if we go down here, you've got Orion's Belt. So look out for those three stars, um, very bright and prominent in the sky. And we can often use them as pointers to help find our way to other things. Um, and then hanging down from Orion's Belt is Orion's Sword, which looks like another little collection of stars. But if you get in there with your telescope, then you will see in the middle of Orion's sword is actually a nebula. And it's the nearest large region of star formation to the solar system. Um, it's a really good deep sky object to start off with if you haven't um, seen any deep sky objects before. If you're a beginner um, in your small telescope or even in a pair of binoculars, it will look like a fuzzy smudge. 
Um, and you might be able to see the trapezium cluster, which is four young stars in the centre of the nebula, um, if you are using a telescope. And finally, this month, I want to talk about the Orionids. So you can see the radiant of the meteor shower has been marked helpfully um, over here. So just up above the, the head of Orion. Um, you can spot Orionid meteors all month. Um, so anytime you're out in the, in the evening time during October, look out for Orionid meteors. Um, the peak is during the daytime on the 21st. Um, and we won't be seeing meteors in the daytime so the the best time to look um, if you want to observe around the peak is the night of the 20th into the morning of the 21st or the night of the 21st into the morning of the 22nd um, and the best time to observe is probably from a, around nine o'clock so let's let's go to nine o'clock here we are nine o'clock um or a little bit later than nine o'clock since the radiant hasn't risen at nine o'clock. Maybe half past nine or so. Um, so from half past nine, ten o'clock in the evening um, and then watch all the way until dawn if you can or for as long as you want to. Um, the meteors themselves come from debris left by Halley's Comet um, and every year when the Earth passes through the debris stream from the comet, bits of uh, that debris burn up in the atmosphere and you see those um, bits that are burning up as meteors. Um, best way to observe is to find a dark spot. Let your eyes adapt. Uh, so maybe give your eyes about 20 minutes. Don't look at any sources of white light. Don't look at your phone. Um, grab a comfortable chair or something to lie down on. Um, maybe some snacks, maybe some hot chocolate, and um, enjoy the show. You'll know if your meteor that you can see is an Orionid because its a path will appear to originate back at Orion. Um, so if you sketch all of the meteors that you see, sketch their path across the sky, and then look at them at the end, they should all appear to be coming um, from the direction of Orion. Uh, you don't have to locate Orion and look in that direction. Um, you can look in any direction um, to, to spot the meteors. Um, looking sort of south, southeast is most interesting, in my opinion, because of everything that's going on in this part of the sky. Um, but you don't have to do that. And looking at an altitude of about 60 degrees, um, so focusing your attention around 60 degrees high. But again, you don't have to do that. Really, if you go out around the peak on a clear night, let your eyes adapt, lie down and watch the sky for a while, then it's very likely that you will see some Orionid meteors. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for October and I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.